we talked about before, this seems like architecture is kind of in between right now, but it seems to be, I'm, I'm, I was trying to produce in this, this, work, this book, um, staking a claim on something that, um, could, that, that could set up an argument, and set up a discourse. And then it, it would say it's my responsibility as an architect and definitely as a, a teacher to um, to the best I can uh, make cognizant the thinking behind the work and um, and staking a claim um, politically, culturally, in terms of architecture's role in in contemporary society. And I'd, it seems to me that would be um, more or less obligatory, certainly for a teacher. And um, that would set up the argument, because it would be my job for somebody like you, for a, a critic, a journalist, or, or somebody that's now saying, I've looked at this person, I've talked with this person, and this is what they say they do, and this is their interests, et cetera. This is what these, these, these roles are. That you, you set up the, the discourse of yes or no, or I, I agree or disagree, or, um, or you make a complete different claim in a very different direction of what architecture is or isn't, based on that conversation, and um, and and I and, I, <clears throat> and it seemed to me, as I was saying earlier, that that um, I wanted to do that in the kind of the clearest way possible, and in, 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 um, that it needed to be kind of stated very succinctly, and and again, I worked for quite a while coming up with these six territories. And to begin with, even the organization of, the, of these six terms are the, the way of organizing the best I can, the way of explaining my interests, which are not singular. Which, which, because again, architecture has this vast kind of territories of interests, right? And it's just to organize that itself is, is, a, is a bit of a project to be able to explain the nature, a lot of which um, with most architects or many architects, is going to come quite intuitively at some point where we don't have to, we don't have to organize it in that fashion. It just takes place, and it's also quite complicated in a creative process because it doesn't happen in any singular specific sequence. It happens in a much more kind of random way, having to do with the, spe this, the specifics of a project or the particular time you're dealing with it or the team you're dealing with, it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? The various terms of the project that are taking place as you develop something, right? The environment that, that surrounds you as you're producing something. Anyway, and, and I came up with this, I came up with these cinders, and again, it'd be another time, but be curious, I'd like you to read them and you tell me in a future time since we have some time together. But, and it started with, um, um, beginnings seem to be the most basic. So how does architecture start? What happens, what's happening in your, your cognitive and your instinctive kind of world? Right, that 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 um, allows you to begin one of these things, and and I did that on that basis, and I'm trying to say again as succinctly as possible, and I'm 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 doing it with an, a notion of history, and that I'm going to attack um, early modernism, and an idea of the universal, and it, it would be Hobbesheimer or Mies, I'm going to challenge in terms of the um, that singularity, of of, of output, Hobbesheimer, right, and. Um, and the, in my mind, it'll be, it'll be then a critique of the, um, the self-similarity and uh, the simplicity of a language which is um, finally has to solve uh, more or less infinite kind of conditions at, at every level, social, political, infrastructural, etc. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to say beginning. We begin with an early assessment of the uniqueness of each project in order to form operational strategies specific to its idiosyncrasies. Boom. Agree or disagree, right? Um, cognizant of the vastness, the breadth of architecture's multiple trajectories <clears throat> as a social, economic, political, cultural, and logistical art form, we are committed to an idea that no single theory of architecture, no a priori concept, not a priori, it'll, be, it'll go into that, survives the first contact with contingency. That is, you enter this world, right? That it's gonna be a connection between um, an intentionality 
or, or an alignment of some beginning conceptual framework and the messiness of reality. We cast a wide net in our research for innovation which draws on our intuitive sense of how the, the fertile territories inherent in both the conceptual and the pragmatic, the connection, not purely theoretical work, not, not pragmatic work, it's the alignment of those two, right? The conceptual and the pragmatic will find balanced roles in the project. That there's going to be creative impulses that come out of the pragmatic world as it is out of your conceptual world, all right? And again, I'm writing this for um, young people. People buy books. I'm, they're, they're, they're starting a career, and um, they could be in a place which is somehow where pragmatic is somehow evil. And I go, oh, no. Nah. That's where all kinds of ideas come from, and they come from the uniqueness of just being alert and aware, right? That's how you're, 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 you're constantly translating what the contemporary is, right? What your circumstances is different than a generation or two generations in front of you, or in today's world, a couple hours in front of you maybe, right? There's no possibility of uncoupling the conceptual from the programmatically obligatory, obligatory, Architecture is a social art form. We don't have a choice. Who are we talking about in Chile or Peru? The radish. Okay. There's characters that can produce unique things that, that don't deal with the, the, the obligatory. As an architect, um, producing um, most of the work in my career has been public work. It's been schools, universities, courthouses, public buildings. I, I'm not an isolated person in my conceptual world and in my subjective world. I absolutely have obligations as an architect and, and I think finally I'm going to be judged or architects are going to be judged by this alignment between what you can bring to it, which is kind of challenging and somewhat, um, uh, I'm trying to say that, you're, you're going to challenge the, the, the traditionally performative with new ideas that connect to its, its usefulness in various, or its, its, its reading, which is going to make you um, very much part of, uh, of shaping the world. That is, you can, in fact, change notions that are social, cultural, et cetera, right? That it's, it's, that, <clears throat> it's that, 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 that intersection between the obligatory and, and the conceptual. Both allow for the initiation of new questions, especially when repeatedly juxtaposed one against the other as we develop a design. The questions initiated during problem formation establish the basis for the autonomous self to engage a range of conversations that evolve to resemble a more collective self. Right? That finally, it's that, that connection is a, that I work well in my firm. I, I already kind of understand architecture is a collective act. and and. I'm constantly balancing myself and my collective self is the nature of, I would say, again, the definition of architecture. There is no single entry point based on the specificity, the uniqueness. It's not formulaic. Each one requires a unique idiosyncratic approach, going back to the early thing, that you're adjusting your, your operational strategy with your assessment of the various uniquenesses of that project. Right? We locate architecture's appropriate role in complex, multiple, ever-changing ecologies. We explore architecture's potential, and we expand its strategic capacity within multiple contemporary infrastructures. Architecture is always simultaneously autonomous and engaged. I tried to say it as clearly as I could that, right, the notion of the beginnings and its role within um, the various contingencies of reality that we're, we're burdened with, social, political, cultural, ecological, infrastructure, urbanistic, right? And, um, but we're engaged. There's no, there's no possibility of being unengaged until we move into our purely con conceptual territory. It's not architecture anymore. It's now maybe forming our work and now I can produce conceptual structure 
my own constructions that are operating artistically free from those obligations. Would normally you'd paint Corbusier, what you paint, you sculpt, etc. In my case, it's more constructing conf physical configurations. Now I'm on my own. Now I operate. Um, I, I can disengage to some degree, and I'm operating with the self in the more traditional sense, right? And um, I'm not going to make it through here, but it gives you an idea. And because the relational objects, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to try to say as clear as I can that um, from, the, from very early on, I've been interested in the relationship of things. And I see that as actually part of a, a broader kind of conversation about society, that we find um, agreements that form the basis of organizational ideas. And I'm interested in, in an architecture that the, 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 the part whole in, in a, in a in a, in a classical sense, I've kind of expanded the role of the part and given it a more primary autonomous role than Palladio, where part is always subservient to whole. And in mine, the part escapes. And that escape is shown very literally the Blades House, that these elements come from different things. And they're all vying for some central position, but they're ne never given a, pr a prominence of, 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 a of a control, a single control. They all have to share within a larger language. <clears throat> and it's been something I've been interested in from the, from the very beginning that just somehow came very early intuitively. Um, but it was it, like the attack of uh, spatial simplicity, um, Hilbesheimer, it was an advance of differentiation and the way of inventing things through, through their interconnection. And now it's much more biological. It's just about molecular, cellular behavior. That as cells interact, they produce new conditions, right? And, and literally everything I've done is, is about a language that has that capacity to uh, continually reinvent the ground, which has been obvious, and again, from the very beginning, um, and it was definitely influenced by like, some of these things I, that I have very clear influences that we're mentioning. That definitely the, 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 the double negative and, and, and Nazca, um, Raymond, Abraham, and Lebius later, uh, Diggers, whether it's Nazca and it goes back to uh, Chaco Canyon, which was part of my education undergraduate school, Diggers, the most fundamental primitive notion of, of inhabiting the earth or scraping symbolically like Nazca, leaving the essence of man existed, that we exist, right? Because those are just insane. The fact that they could actually make a figure at a scale they could never see. I mean, it's really, really, the more you look at it, it's, it's, it's actually just absolutely, it's hard to ever figure out that, that they never themselves, right? Could, it wasn't discovered until the late 30s when they flew over it, right? A huge effect on me, and um, and all of them were in, involved in, in various notions of excavation as the most primitive act of dealing with the, the ground. And being in LA, um, uh, first growth city, everything you've seen, this building, first thing kind of on the land. So I'm in a city that's the first. We're just beginning kind of the reshaping of the surface, right? And uh, probably would have something to do with that. Then definitely probably wouldn't have happened if I grew up in, in Firenze or Milano or something. Um, the combinatory is now about language, and it again, goes way back to the beginning. I guess it started with collage, and it could be more and more interesting, the, 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 the connection of these things and, and a language of that connection that um, uh, has, has a continuity. And then chance behavior, which would, again, these things are going to interconnect. The use of, of um, the world as it's found and instead of making opinions of it's right or wrong, it just is. I have, um, try not to make opinions. You just find stuff that, um, well, you understand um, it's Joyce looking out the window. The reality of the world is cacophony. It's, it's apparent chaos. As, as, and it, it's, it's, it's even more so with information, what, what is it, with, uh, the reality of the world with the multiplicity culturally and the multiplicity and, and kind of every aspect. It's, it's these series of things that happen through, through just collisions and accidents. And then, of course, in city making, um, 
in all of our, of our, of our great metropolitan areas. Um, for me, the things that have always been the most interested are not the organizational Cartesian stuff. It's the accidents. It's Rome, where it's layers of, of different systems as they stack up one another. And that's the part that's, that's the most dynamic, the most interesting, is you get these two things clashing. And they're clashing not just in physical terms. They're, they're, they represent whole systems of thought. They represent whole pieces of history. And it, it produces, for me, it's the final, kind of the most interesting act of city making, of our, of our, um, of our social, cultural ability to leave behind our artifacts that have to do with how we kind of occupy this earth, right? How we, um, how we reshape it, et cetera. And um, that whole notion of chance behavior became kind of thing. And then we were discussing earlier, this last one, I couldn't quite give up the name, but nearness, the, um, and I'm looking at kind of as many territories as I can cover here in terms of my interest that lead to this, it has to do with scalar, tactility, the human character, the door handle, the thing that you absolutely engage with. Um, and, and then this is going to, mm, this will be interesting today because I would have said traditionally it would be the most domestic versus the, the, the public. And today I would go, mm, I'm not so sure. I'm going to mix that. That maybe what's missing in uh, the, the institutional work, a hospital, say, which we, we had something to do with early with, uh, we did an oncology center, would be, mm, actually it's the reverse. This would become up, it'd be extremely important that someone's relationship to this environment would very much have to do with something that's more haptic, sensual, et cetera, and it's gonna have much more to do with the, 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 the scale of the hand or something. And um, again, it's gonna be something that's gonna find its, find its appropriateness Maybe later in the architectural process, as you you move through the larger kind of issues, that you're you're down to materiality and into that kind of scale of thinking with the work, right? Anyway, um, I wrote this for <laughs> I wrote this for you, and uh, maybe next time or maybe in your future, um, it, it would be you would ask me now a series of questions as you look this more specifically and say, well, I agree or don't agree, or do, do, are we really on solid ground here? And, um, or you would kind of just expand it or whatever your, the point being, it, it'd be a, a place where we could um, find agreement or disagreement or, or, or conversation actually, or some, uh, it would begin a finding even some common ground of what do we talk about in terms of um, various architectures. We so what's different of how I approach something in, in, in Mr. Moss, or, 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 or Mr. Hodges, right? And um, what are we? What is the discussion, by the way? Which I would have said a bit problematic at the moment, ain't none? Or it's I'm being a little I'm, like usual. I don't go emphasize everything, but it's it, it could be kind of expanded. Let's say what what are the dip, what what's on um, what's at stake right now? What are the ideas? And as I said, for the, um, the young, you interviewed a lot of young people. If I was you, that's the first thing I want to know. I'm talking to whatever, the young, 30, 40, pre-50, pre-45, whatever young in architecture is. I'm going to want to know what's at stake. So you're, we've got different ideas here. So idea, what is the idea? What, what, are, you, <coughs> what are you promoting? Meaning, <coughs> um, promoting, I guess, what? Meaning, how are, how, is, how are all of us participating and moving the general role of architecture and the definition of architecture in, in contemporary society? What is that role? And uh, how are we shaping the profession? Because that would have to do clearly with our... Um, in our in our teaching and our working with the next next young generation, it would have to be um, it would be it would, it would have to be kind of primary in a conversation. What, what is it that what what are the, the in fact the primary concerns of architecture today, and how would that even start shaping pedagogy? And 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 you're finally you're done with your your project at the end of a fifteen week semester. 
what's at stake? You're now giving a presentation in front of eight people. What's the argument? Other than just another set of aesthetic shapes. And if there isn't one, or if it's a weak one, you couldn't have that too prominent without not having a profession. What does the profession stand for? It, because now it could be, and I could be with somebody as this is all bullshit. I'm just I'm building buildings and making a living and have, have the conversation, whatever it is. And um, it's just to serve a society and make things. doesn't need any of this. Then you'd say that's the nature of the profession and it would be like a certain element of law. You, you could do that with a lot of professions to say it's not interested in, it's just in maintaining some given thing. Um, and you would definitely find a very, very vibrant conversation in law about rewriting, reconnecting an original set of ideas to continually change in contemporary situations. So the Second Amendment couldn't possibly intend to anticipate the technology of a rifle today. Not possible that those framers, when they, I forgot what it took, three minutes to load, put powder, do this, and do this, and it sometimes blew up in your face, and, and it also the chance of hitting something were also minimal, to um, the technology today that, that's this unimaginable, right? And there are going to be a group of people that are going to say, we absolutely um, have to see this set of rules as open-ended and that we were going to, we have to reinterpret them based on what that first writing of the Second Amendment was that connects to current situations when you have weaponry that now can kill many, many people within seconds, right? With, with, with again, with ever increasing accuracy, et cetera, et cetera, speed, et cetera. And, and with that, a social situation which allows that person has nothing to do with military activity, you can walk in the store and buy it. Cheap, right? Inexpensive. Versus another group of people who are gonna fight like hell for the original. Come on, we have to have something of that parallel conversation, right? Because that's an important conversation. Um, maybe ours isn't quite as, doesn't have the same implication, but it has to have some of that. Otherwise, what the hell? <laughs> or why are you even, you, you, you and I have to interview architects. I mean, I'm gonna go back asking you a question. So you're interviewing, what, what do you get out of it? You've just interviewed 12 people and you come back and write something, what happened? So what, what, what took place in those 12 interviews? And what were the differences, similarities? What did that tell you about what architects do today? and what the next young generation versus the old, ah, and then you're looking at generationally or whatever. Um, there's a new, there's a, Ken Burns put out a, that three-part film on Muhammad Ali that I just finished saying, that I just saw the, 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 the third, third one. And uh, it's kind of interesting. This is a character that was interested in changing behavior and it was fairly clear what he wanted to change and boxing was his delivery system and um, was his mechanism to get there, but his project was social cultural. And um, maybe some of this, this, this stuff you're doing with the interviews, definitely somebody that shaped me. And whether it was more or less than Corbusier, I have no idea, but maybe more. Maybe finally, um, I came out of an era going, boy, there's things happening here that are just really powerful. And there's people that have the courage to do that when they were kids, he was 19 when he started, 18. He, he, was, he was born with this, this, right? And that would have to affect how you go about your craft, <laughs> that somehow that, that mm, it seems like one of the potentials in today's world is that as an individual, you can in some way shape the world. And as an architect, you actually literally shape the world, right? And, and that shaping physically represents um, ideas that you cannot disconnect now from the social, cultural, political, ecological, technological, et cetera. And then the next question is, you, you, you've got to go left or right. You, you make some sort of a stand for that and say that I, I'm going to go this way and not that way. 
And again, that's what I'm trying to do is I try to myself to kind of articulate kind of what this stuff means. And the last would be the look, could care less. That's your, that's other people. You like it or don't like it, that's your business. Do I have, of course I do, I'm a visual person. Is that the, my major concern? Not at all. Actually, it's the least of my concerns. It's, um, it, it, it looks like, it, it, it ends up looking like something at the end of a process and done deal. And if it looks more like a spider or a turtle or an amoeba, it happened to be a set of questions I'm asking and this is what it ended up looking like. And it's not any a priori. In fact, if anything, um, I'm stuck with certain preconceptions that I can't get rid of. It's, it's a burden that I can't get rid of. Um, I wish I had ability to push it much further and I'm stuck. I'm literally stuck with my own intuitive, whatever it is. Just, you, you have certain memories that you can't, what, memory and history and you're embedded with habit and habitual behavior or something that you can't escape. It's, a, it's more, it's a problem. And, uh, um, but it'd be the last thing. I'm gonna go, ah, and the next thing I'm gonna ask you right away, if you ask that, whose look? Which culture? You wanna bring it, it from Thailand? Nairobi? Siberia? South Africa, bring in your character, and which one? Ah, of a certain education, of a certain kind of knowledge base, etc. Come on, it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural condition. And um, is anybody to agree that this tower is somehow beautiful or compelling or something? I have no idea. Now is it 20% or 19 or two or 80? Obviously, I'm interested in being a larger number because it's a public building. Mm. I'm mixed. Every city now wants odd, kind of weird buildings. It's uh, our Caltrans building. Was, they were calling it Darth Vader, and there were all kinds of names for it. Oh, I thought that was super cool. Everybody wants a building they can hate. It has a, a character, et cetera. And I go, of course. If it was neutral, now I'd have a problem. If it didn't speak. But it, the, the most important thing is not whether you like it or don't like it. Does it have a voice? Does it actually stand for something, right? And, and then I'll get letters from people saying I should be put in prison because I built that building because it's so ugly. And I get other people that write me love letters that think it's the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. I'm going, wow, that's kind of interesting. Because I look at it and, and I think it's kind of tough. And mm, this. And, the love letter wouldn't have been my thing, but someone else finds this really beautiful. I go, that's interesting. Um, but it, it just has a voice. But what's really important, if they kept asking questions, I built it for nothing, because the city had nothing. I had no choice. So it, we built that building for under $200 a square foot. It's a parking garage. And I figured out how to use materials, and I'm, I'm tracing, well, like, like in LA, of Frank Gehry or whatever, making it out of just really simple things because um, that's what I have and I'm trying to I'm trying to make something that is compelling for sure and um, I'm, I'm playing with graphics and two-dimensionality with a huge 100 sign it's the center of LA 100 100 so I'm going ah kind of cool site I got a site that there's four of them that is first and main so it's 100 100 and it's like okay so I put a big 100 sign up and the good news with the, the, the connection I actually made a connection with a client that would have never let anybody do that what I did there because I just that's that would be the real conversation how the hell did you get that building built with the state of California for $180 a square foot that's what Frank will ask me somebody that knows knows architecture will go wow how'd you do that one <laughs> just, <laughs> and uh and get Keystone to put that big light piece in it and now they have uh, events and we're making a public space they build a public space in a city that has no interest in public space and we won the competition because we were the only comp. Ram was in that competition too. They all filled the block. And we, we left a public, a quarter of the block, a quarter of the whole block as a public space. And again, I'm gonna go back and say, no, the real ideas there is publicness, is the site condition, is the environment, moving skin that comes from Purvey, right? That we took out um, a third of the energy, the largest solar wall at that time ever built. And it was, it was absolutely pragmatics. And, um, 
to get that building built. And it just, it, this looks like it does. And it had to be metal because it had to move and it had to let light in. And so it came from this intersection of ideas and conceptualizations and huge, huge reality of accepting reality. Otherwise, you couldn't take the job. Not your job, right? Couldn't do it. And um, not only acknowledging those realities, but in some way celebrating them. I'm celebrating that I built it for 180 bucks. This is what you get when you just have nothing. I have simple structure and floor, nothing. This is the most stripped down building you can get, but it's performative, right? Environmentally and social and culturally. And um, that's my claim. And after that, let's go at it. And <laughs> you, you, you become attacked from all, you, you get attacked for now it's ugliness or whatever the, the thing you ended up with, right? Um, anyway.